Hi, I'm Michael Burke, and this is Money Talks. Hi, welcome to Money Talks. I'm at Twin Disc today with John Batten, the president and CEO. But John, before we talk to you, I would like to um, read our little um, thank you to the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Today's show is brought to you by Total Furniture, your friends in the furniture business, where you save 20 to 50% off name brands. Open for to save you more at 8400 75th Street in Kenosha, open Friday through Monday. So John Batten, uh, as you know well, I. I talked to you at the time that your dad died in early May mm -hmm. of 2015 and was kind of hoping to get you on the show to talk about him. I think I told you this, that Chris Hepper Jesse, your farmer's CFO, mm -hmm. emailed me uh, shortly after, within days of that story of mine running, and he said, boy, I've heard from people from all over the globe, pretty much every continent but Antarctica, who knew your dad. So mm -hmm. that's part of the part of what we want to talk about. Uh, tell me, let's... Tell me a little bit about the start of his career, because it was really an, an interesting time. Yeah, he started um, at Twin Disc in 1970. Um, and in 1970, I don't think Twin Disc had experienced any type of major downturn. Um, it was really all kind of post-World War I, then the World War II years we did the landing craft transmission, mm -hmm. so it was continued growth yeah. and growth and growth around the world. Uh, and when my father came in 1970, there was still a lot of oil and gas a lot of construction business, and that kind of drove everything um, into the early 80s. And my grandfather was still very active and was still active as chairman and CEO. We should explain for somebody who doesn't yeah. know, Twin Disc makes transmissions. So power, talk power transmission equipment, whether that's clutches, gearboxes, um, for marine applications, land base. So anything kind of behind a diesel engine, our clutches and gearboxes make, make the power work. Um, but getting back to my father, it was kind of 1982, the big oil crash, um, and that was his first year as CEO, and, and the company shrank by two-thirds. That's incredible. So very similar type of um, feeling that we had back in 2009, um, where everything kind of just disappeared rapidly. Do you know how the company reacted at the time? There must have been layoffs, like there crazy. There a huge amount of layoffs. Pro you know, roughly proportional, say two-thirds um, of the hourly workforce and the number of hours. Um, wow. Some people were let go permanently and were never called back. Wow. Some people were let go and eventually called back years later, whether wow. a year or two. Um, and they did a lot of it at the time, kind of an A and a B shift. So for wherever, let's say we were down, you know, still 50%, you had, you know, some people coming to work 20, you know, half of that 50% and the next crew coming into work the next half. So it was very, I remember it being a very stressful time. I was in high school, wasn't working here, but um, you could tell that my father and grandfather were, were very, very stressed about the situation, but they always knew that they would come through. A lot of confidence in the employees. And, and so how did they adjust the company? You were saying that... It was you know, a total, almost a total transformation where up until that point, most of what we did was focused on land, whether it was a PTO, which is really an on-off clutch for, let's say, power an irrigation, power takeoff, an irrigation pump, or a rock crusher or wood chipper, or a transmission, uh, you know, for a, a cat dozer, um, or, you know, an international harvester tractor, or a John Deere tractor. So that was most of the business in marine in a forward reverse uh, clutch and gearbox for, say, a tugboat or a pushboat. Was, was a minor part of the business. Um, but very rapidly they saw in the early 80s that as, you know, when oil and gas went, it took a lot of construction business with it. Um, they had to focus on something else. And what was doing well um, was automotive and some other industries. Um, and the yacht market started to take off. So there were more and more pleasure craft sport fish boats being built. So Why, just more millionaires in the world? Or I, I, I tend to think, yeah. I mean, historically until 2008, the yacht market kind of followed how the, the stock market, you know, Dow Jones was doing. And as that did better, people bought yachts. Um, so they focused on, you know, transforming the, the, the work boat, tugboat line into something that would be more applicable mm -hmm. into a, a high-speed yacht. And that kind of carried the company through the rest of the 80s with some other, you know, 
oil and gas came back a little bit, construction came back, but what really caused growth for the company was the marine business. So they had to react very quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, how do you describe your to people what your dad's management style was? Um, he was uh, very detailed, um, Was you know, did a lot of analysis in his head, of course did it on paper, but he was very good, as we like to say, of being at 50,000 feet, looking at the, the strategy and of what was happening, but then zooming down at each level and getting more and more into the detail. And if he had a question that was strategic or something wasn't going right, um, he often did a lot of the analysis himself and then would ask questions mm. to see what other people thought. Um, always wanted to hear different sides of opinion, but he wanted whoever was involved in the discussion or that he was managing to know the numbers and what made the business work and what was important. Mm -hmm. um, what's your management style? Did you uh, take it, that on? It's a, I certainly started that way. Uh, and still, as people work at maybe sometimes say I get you know, too much into the details. Um, but it's become a lot harder to do that across the business. Um, when he started, we had a plant in the U two plants in the U.S. and one in Belgium, uh, and two distributors that were overseas in Australia and Singapore. Now we have 13 subsidiaries, um, six plants, and so driving down into the detail at each one of those is not possible. Mm -hmm. I certainly follow the big ones like we're seeing here, um, and in Belgium are our two largest plants. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very in tune with the numbers there and what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, but to do that across all 13 and still be involved in the strategy and the growth is, is kind of hard to do. Um, I miss that because I'm you know engineer by trade, so I love, I love jumping into the numbers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll come back to the company in a minute, but um, what it was your your dad was well known for his uh, community endeavors. And uh, just why don't you just reel off some of those? But then also, I want to know what he did in his spare time. Sure. Uh, what he loved to do in his spare time. Yeah, I guess the, you know the big ones that, that people know about would be uh, very involved um, in junior achievement, very involved um, in United Way workforce development. Um, later in his career, got very active in Halo um, oh, and some right? other things. Mm -hmm. And he would spend a lot of time and was always available for meetings and. I, I can't tell you how many times at 4.30, you know, we're 7.30 to 4.30 or 8 to 5 um, hours here uh, for the salary group. How many times at 4.30 or 5 um, meetings would start where he would invite people from around the community and he would go, you know, well past dinner time talking about, you know, important issues for the community. Hmm. Um, I would say, you know, he was never a big golfer early in his career. He tended to be more involved in, you know, the junior achievement type things. Those were his hobbies. Um, later on in life, he got more interested in golf, but the one thing that was kind of the thread all the way through was photography. Um, he loved taking pictures, and he had a dark room, the old chemical dark room, when we were kids. In the um, basement or something? In the basement. Um, mm -hmm. Did a lot of black and white. Kind of lost it a little bit when um, everything went color. Um, he, he didn't do that as well, and um, I think he was just too busy working. But as he got older and he could do a, little, a lot more traveling, he loved to take his digital SLR with him, and he would go on trips with my mother. He called them safaris, but they're really photo safaris. Mm -hmm. Whether it was he's been to India, Russia, back to India, um, all over Canada and all over Wisconsin taking pictures. So mm -hmm. it, it, great pictures. Um, we just never had time to really go, go through all of them yet. Do you do any of that? I... I I take pictures, I'm not a photographer. I love to have the recorded event. Mm -hmm. and maybe I'm pretty good at framing it, but um, mm -hmm. he shot, like he had professional equipment, shot in raw, you know, 25 megabytes. Um, I'm kind of the, you know, 440, <laughs> whatever, the, the 440 or one megabyte, you know, I shoot, okay. you know, much smaller. Okay. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate it, and I'm just in, going back now through his photos, I'm in awe of the quality of his photographs. Yeah. Um, let's finish up by talking about the kind of year you had. It's been a really up and then somewhat down year. What's going on? Yeah, we started, our fiscal year goes from July 1st to June 30th. So our fiscal 2015 started last summer. Um, and seven and a half, eight months through the year, we had our second best year on the bottom line for net earnings going. And then the price of oil... Um, kind of came to a halt and started to drop in December. Um, and what that did was basically put a freeze on continued oil exploration and, and just basically production. And when that happens, the first thing that goes is they pull back on capital equipment. They don't, they don't buy new equipment. Mm 
Um, they idle some, and then they'll use what's ever working. So it really affects us in oil and gas sales, but it also has a dampening effect on a big part of the economy, whether it's you know construction, minerals. Um, kind of when the price of oil goes down, it's a signal that the global economy is starting to slow down. Right. And so everybody, at least in capital goods, starts to pull back. Uh -huh. And so um, it's, had, it's had a big effect on the rest of our business, so much so that you know, it still finished a great year as far as net earnings, but the last four months um, were not very good at all. And it's kind of a slide into our new fiscal year. And, and by the way, the yacht sales that just went, uh, that literally sank, pun intended, yep. with the last recession, those haven't really come back. No, that, that market <clears throat> globally, you know, 75 to 80 percent down. And there are pockets of activity, mostly in the U.S., in the Carolinas, we call it the Outer Banks, and um, then up in a couple good builders in New Jersey, and then in Australia. But the rest of the market really hasn't recovered. And our pleasure craft market is kind of in that middle zone of 40 to 80 feet. Okay. Um, there's certainly still a market for those 100 plus footers of the billionaires. That market never really went away. Um, but you know, we, there's not a whole lot of content there. So you can't divulge any secrets, you're publicly traded, but um, in general, what are you looking for? Uh, are you looking for something that you can do now that's akin to what happened in the 80s where you went bigger into something Ab else? Absolutely. It's, uh, we have to find um, a product or a technology, uh, maybe a geography, that is not as reliant on oil and gas. Certainly on the land-based side, but pressure pumping, um, drilling exploration, find a product that has a broad use um, outside of oil and gas. So that is my number one job, is to diversify us away from oil and gas, per se, so we're, we don't get these big swings. All right. Well, listen, John Batten, so much, uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks to our producer, Scott Anderson. We'll see you next time.